Hi friends, I hope you're having a wonderful day today. My name is Bailey Sarian and this is the Dark History Podcast. Round of applause. Ooh, you get it? Come on, going round. Anyways, if you're a curious cat like myself, then come on this journey. Come on, let's go together and let's learn something new, shall we? Okay, so I kind of like to do an intro to all of my podcast stories so far where I kind of tell you the background as to where I got inspired for this story, you know? So um, let me tell you what today's all about because the other night I was laying in bed, it's like two in the morning and naturally I'm thinking about Ed Gein. What? He was a very interesting person. If you don't know who Ed Gein is, I did a whole story about him on my murder mystery and makeup over on my YouTube. In summary, he would dig up bodies from graves and like use their skin to make super unique shit to say the least like lampshades, chairs, wall art. It was different, it was it was different. But then again, because it's 2 a.m., my mind is like wandering all over the place, right? And I was like, how sick is it that in high school, they make you or students dissect frogs? I mean, my, my school didn't have the budget for that. Instead, they showed us pictures of what the frog looked like on the inside with like arrows pointing to What's in a frog, you know, I don't know. Obviously it didn't stick, for me at least. Then it led me to when did humans start dissecting other humans? Because I had to start somewhere, right? You know, like have you ever paid attention to how your mind just jumps around? I didn't think so, but this is how mine works. Okay, so let's open up my dark history book and gain some knowledge. Shall we? Yes, we shall. Let's go, okay. Here we go. Medical science had to start somewhere, right? I mean, like how did doctors or scientists learn how like the human body even worked in the first place? Like where's the heart located or where's the stomach, you know? Whatever else is inside of us, like where's that at? Well, in order to learn the inside of the body, dissection was a pretty important part of the game. So naturally that got me thinking and I started Googling away, looking into the history of dissection. Oh yes, oh yes, remember, see? Ed Gein, frogs, dissection, it's coming together. Shush, it's coming together. Anyway, so that's when I came across something called the Doctor's Riot, which took place in the 1700s, right? Now this was super sketchy. Essentially the problem was that doctors used to just straight up steal bodies right out of the graves, okay? And then they'd carry them back to the lab and then use them to practice on. I mean, okay, sure. But the biggest problem here was that they didn't ask. They didn't ask the families. They didn't ask the dead person before they died. They didn't ask a damn soul, okay? A graveyard was like running to the store really quick, but instead of picking up a gallon of milk, you were picking up, you know, a freshly dead grandma. I mean, that's how it was treated. I don't know. I didn't say that. That's, it's kind of like that. I was giving you an example. Now again, this kind of makes sense. I said kinda, you know, like they had to start somewhere and the only way to learn was to open up actual bodies. But the biggest obstacle in the doctor's way, religion, religion's the problem. You see, cemeteries were, and they still are considered a very sacred place. Many believing that if the body of your friend slash family were not in their grave, then their souls would not go to heaven. Forever they would be stuck in this limbo and I mean, that's the ultimate punishment. So what do you think happened when a bunch of doctors took it upon themselves to steal bodies from the local cemeteries without telling a soul? Well, I'm sure you can imagine that didn't go over so well. And that my friends is what leads us to today's story, the doctor's riot. Babe, let's set the scene. Let's go back to the year 1788. The place, New York City. New York City was nothing like we know it today. I mean, there were no skyscrapers. There wasn't all the, like the hustle and bustle. Manhattan was basically just a farmland at the time. And the tallest buildings were the churches with their bell towers. Sweet Baby Jesus was the center of everyone's lives and, and towns. New York City was a brand new land to this place we were just calling America, which at the time had a population around 30,000 people. 
It was a starting point for most immigrants, and when they came to America, their first stop would be in New York. So most of them were Irish and German immigrants, and this being 1788, there were still a lot of Native American tribes in the area, but a big chunk of this population was actually enslaved people. They made up around one-fifth of the entire population. So they made up about 20% of the population at the time. A lot of people nowadays associate slavery with the South, but it was common all over America and especially in the growing city of New York. And like the majority of America at this time, cemeteries, they were even segregated. So there were different graveyards for white people and black people. I'm not just like bringing this up randomly. This is important to the story because a lot of this centers around white doctors using a black cemetery as a personal body store quote unquote, for science, of course. I mean, I say it in quotes, but it was really in the name of science. So let's talk about science at the time in New York City. If you wanted to be someone in medicine, then you went to King's College Medical School. Now this was established just 20 years earlier in 1767 and was technically the only medical school in New York. If you went to King's College at this time, you were considered like, Oh my God, a rock star of medicine and highly respected. I'm taking a wild guess here and I'm also rolling my eyeballs, uh, but I'm assuming it was mainly for, you know, the whiteies. One of the biggest things that the school was looking into was the study of anatomy, the human body. How did the body work, you know? We take for granted now that all this work had been done already, but back then, I mean, they didn't know anything. You break a bone, they're like, well, what'd you break? And the doctor's like, I don't know, it looks bad though, so we should do something about it. You know, so it's like they were interested in learning more and to do this, they again had to dissect bodies. New York wanted laws like they had in Massachusetts. So you know how today you can sign up to donate your body to science or universities on your ID for when you die? Well, back in 1770s, when you died, you had to be buried and like that was your only option, boring. But New York wanted to be again like Massachusetts, who already had some laws in place. For example, if you died in a duel, remember duel, we talked about it in the Andrew Jackson story, great. So if you died in a duel, it was legal for your body to be used for dissection. So doctors in Massachusetts didn't have any trouble finding bodies to dissect. Doctors in New York City wanted a similar law, but because of all like the religious reasons and also just the idea that people thought doctors cutting into bodies was honestly really creepy and gross, the city was just like, mm, no, no bodies for you, no. So this made it so the only real legal way to get rid of a dead body was pretty straightforward. You had to bury it. And once the body was buried, nobody could dig it up unless their relatives gave them permission. If you got caught digging up a body, I'm looking at you, Ed Gein, you best believe your ass, you know, is going to jail. The other thing preventing New York from adopting laws like Massachusetts was that the church had a lot of influence in the city. Again, there was one medical school and a shit ton of churches. So honestly, they were just outnumbered. And the college had a hard time getting their hands on some bodies. I mean, they need something to practice on. So this left professors at King's College with three choices. One, give up on teaching anatomy altogether. Two, teach quote unquote theory about the human body. So basically just guessing. Or three, they could steal some bodies themselves. Well, not to spoil the entire episode, but these doctors, they wanted bodies, right? I mean, they were gonna catch a body whether the church said they could or not. So they got their brightest candles and they marched through cow shit in the dead of night and started digging up freshly deceased people from what was called like commoners graves. Let's pause for an ad really quick. Hold on, BRB. Hi, just popping in here really quick for an advertisement. An advertisement, hi. Seasons are a change in and so will your personal taste. So if you're tired of like the summer vibes and you're ready for something new, well baby, it's fall. It's fall, baby. Yes, the time has come for fall. Uh. But it's time to vamp up your fall with a change in decor, all while upgrading your comfort. That's where Brooke Linen comes in. 
Brooke Linen makes beautiful, high quality bedding and everything you need to make your house a home. We love that. And it doesn't stop with bedding. They make every day a spa day with a huge selection from their excellent and absorbent towel collection. Yeah, it's, an, it's available in a number of colorways. And on top of that, Brook Linen has over 80,000 five-star reviews and counting. I personally have their bed sheets, which are breathable, they're plush, they're buttery soft, mm, love it. And they're so cozy. But like, don't even get me started on their towels, which is <laughs> so weird to say, like I'm obsessed with their towels. I never thought I'd be that person, but here I am. I am absolutely in love with the their towels. It's like a hug. It's like a warm, cozy hug. And it's so plush and comfortable. And I love their towels. I never thought about towels much until I got some from Brooklinen. And it's been changed. I am changed, okay? Freshen up your fall with Brooklinen, the one-stop shop for comfort. Right now they're having like a Labor Day savings event um, and you could just save on all things comfort. And if you can't decide right now, like let's say you go there, beep, bop, boop, put stuff in your basket and you're like, you know what? I don't know, let me think about this. That's okay because you can use the promo code DARKHISTORY anytime. Okay, so that's brooklinen.com. Use the promo code DARKHISTORY and get some, some savings going. Thank you, Brooklinen, for partnering with me on today's episode. Now let's get back to the story. Shall we? We shall. Now, at this time, the local government did supply some bodies to doctors at these schools, okay? But they would only give them a few at a time. I mean, bodies are kind of limited. So here's the thing. All these bodies belong to criminals that had been recently executed and the dissection was actually considered part of their punishment. Damned in life, damned in death. That's how New York looked at it. But there still wasn't enough executions to meet the demand for bodies. And I'm not even making this part up. There were public hangings in New York at this time and medical students from rival schools would actually fight over who gets the corpse? Super hard times, I know, super rough. So you know how nowadays teachers barely have enough school supplies because of budget cuts? Well, it's kind of like that. Since students at King's College were expected to bring a quill for writing, some paper to write on, and their own human body. Not theirs, another one to bring in. Bring your own, you know, supplies. Because it's not like the professors were always able to get their hands on a body to study with. So they just kind of like, you know, left it up to the students. And yeah, it was frowned upon to dig up the bodies, but like, you know, they probably just, they didn't ask too many questions about where the students were getting the bodies, if you know what I mean. Like the school couldn't officially ask for students to rob graves, right? Of course, this is considered taboo and, and risky, but these students are young, they're 19. They're, they feel entitled and everything is a competition. I think it's almost more funny to picture teachers alluding to it. Like, I don't know, you gotta show up with a body tomorrow, but don't steal it, just come with one. So the kids just kind of like went for it and they would get drunk beforehand to do it because again, they're 19 years old, they're college students and they're carrying bodies all over town. Graveyards for the poor were usually just open plots of land with maybe a light fence. And of course they didn't have security. Well, again, the doctors needed bodies. Well, we get it, Bailey. So they weren't going to target the graveyards of the rich and famous. That'd be too, too risky. Instead, they'd go after the graveyards of poor people and unmarked graves. Now those they viewed as, quote, lesser than in society. So they figured if no one cared about them while they were living, eh, no one's gonna care about them when they're dead, you know? Great, free bodies. So when the students needed bodies, guess where they looked? The graves of enslaved people. And they thought nobody would question it. Yeah, they thought. So let me introduce you to a man named Scipio Gray. Oh yeah, now he had a small but important role in this story. You see our guy Scipio was a formerly enslaved person, a free man who bought a big empty lot and made it a private burial ground for his community. Now, Scipio owned the yard, lived in a house next to it, and just kept the graveyard clean. 
Scipio's graveyard was about a half a mile from King's College, and it wasn't even the closest one. But all the other graveyards kept getting robbed, and so members of the community started to guard the ones that were closer to the college. So students started to get a little bold, a little brash, and they would go all the way out to Scipio's graveyard to get some bodies. Half a mile is a long way to sneak a whole ass body. Have you ever tried to move a dead body? Yeah, I have. It's hard, it's hard, I, or so I hear. Don't ask me how I know, okay? It was like a dare in high school, I don't know, I'm kidding. But am I? I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. But poor Scipio kept getting his graves robbed. And of course, nobody wanted to do anything about it because oh, I freaking roll, they were graves of enslaved people. I mean, this grave robbing thing was happening to everyone. So by their logic, as long as the students were getting the bodies they needed from enslaved people's graves, they wouldn't come after the white graves. Great, you know? Scipio and the black community were getting so freaking fed up with this and they decided to start a petition, okay? And they were like begging the city council to address all of this grave robbing. The petition was written by someone who went by the name Humanio, okay? Now that wasn't their real name and whoever it was, they wanted to stay anonymous so, you know, they could protect themselves from any backlash they might receive. That's why you stay anonymous sometimes. So thousands of free and enslaved people, they signed this petition to try and get the city to pay attention, you know? But there was no official response from the government. We don't actually know what came of this petition because it was never even mentioned in any of the meeting records from this time. And I have a sneaking suspicion as to why. Most of the city council, including the mayor, owned enslaved people at this time. It's shitty, yeah but that's like where we're at at this time. Even though the city didn't bother to respond, the petition was printed in the local papers and it got a lot of people wondering, who the hell is this Humanio person? You know, is it a city official? Is it a doctor? Maybe it's Scipio himself? I mean, it is his graveyard that keeps getting robbed, so it would make sense that he would want to speak up. But it's kind of funny. It's actually not funny, but it's kind of funny because the real petition is about addressing like the problems going on with the grave digging. But they're like, who wrote this letter? Let's figure it out. That's where people's brains are at. Great. So the mystery of the petition started a big old back and forth between Humanio and an anonymous medical student who also started writing to the papers. Humanio would write the paper saying that black grave sites needed to be treated just as fairly as white grave sites. Like he's not asking for much, okay? But the student who was writing would basically just say that Humanio was being a big old baby. Like, shut up, Humanio, stay in your lane, you know, let the professionals do their job. That's not condescending at all. We're only talking about the eternal damnation of our loved ones. So readers started picking the letters apart to figure out who the author was. This mystery person had to be able to read and write, so that eliminated a lot of the enslaved people right off the bat. Historians to this day, they don't really know who wrote these letters that enraged the white doctors, but they narrowed it down to a few people. One potential author was a 15 year old, which isn't impossible, but it was highly unlikely. So the historians and the court of public opinion at the time, they decided that Humanio is Scipio. Scipio is Humanio. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you. That was great. We aren't that shocked. But the whole point of staying anonymous is to protect yourself from backlash. And now the people decided Scipio is Humanio. And Jesus, all hell breaks loose for him. Poor guy. His house is broken into by a bunch of grave robbing students and he gets attacked. For what? Now we don't know for sure, but apparently the anonymous medical student from the paper was there too. Now these students all started bullying Scipio and telling him to stop writing these letters. They literally said to him, quote, I'd do this to my own grandma if I had the chance, end quote. Like, okay, well, I don't know, but okay. So they, they just keep robbing him. And when I say robbing him, I mean they were stealing freaking bodies right in front of him, like digging them up. 
I don't know what they were, I think they were like putting the bodies over their shoulder and like walking out. Like that's, it's a little weird, but they were doing that, you know, whatever. Now we're at a point where bodies are being stolen, graves are being robbed, and nobody wants to do anything about it because it's just black bodies being robbed. So you're probably wondering if there's a doctor's riot like the story is about, then when are you gonna get to the doctors going to a riot? You promised me riot, Bailey. Okay, you don't need to riot, calm down. You're at an eight and I need you at a three, okay? I promise we're about to get severed arms, militias, and doctors hiding behind chimneys after this ad break. If you've been dreaming about a beach getaway, but you're nowhere near the ocean, you may need to get those creative juices flowing and you can do just that with Calm. With Calm, you can listen to the relaxing sounds of the waves and give yourself a break wherever you are, right? Oh yes, oh yes. Beautiful. Today I'm partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app to help give you the tools that improve the way you feel. So you can clear your head with guided daily meditations, which can also just overall help improve your focus or maybe drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. Oh, I love that one. It's like you get cradled right to sleep. It's like, shh, hush those thoughts, hush those anxieties right to sleep, my, my, little, my little one. It's like that. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. So if you go to calm.com, C-A-L-M.com slash dark history, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off of a Calm premium subscription. Calm, calm.com. Dark history. Go to calm, C A L M dot com slash dark history for 40% off unlimited access to calm's entire library. That's calm dot com slash dark history. Sleep more, stress less, live better with calm. Thank you, calm, for partnering with me on today's episode. Now let's get back to the story. Hi, we're back. April 13th, 1788. The day that shit really hit the fan. 3 p.m., okay? Some boys, some younger boys are playing outside of the local hospital. You know, what boys do, hopscotch, jacks, pick up sticks. I don't know what they're doing. But they were like hooting and hollering outside, just being loud little boys. I don't have kids, but I'm assuming that's what they were doing. And you know how kids are. They're like the most curious of them all. So being the curious little kids that they were, one of the boys was like, hey, I wonder what's going on inside of the hospital. You know, like we should, we should go peek in and see. So one of them, one of the boys, grabs a nearby ladder, climbs up the side of the, of the building to peek inside the window and see what's going on. So he's like looking inside, like what's going on in there, right? Great. So the boy gets up there and he looks in the window and he sees a doctor named John Hicks working inside. John notices that the, the boys are watching him and he thinks that they're just being annoying. So he grabs a severed arm he's been working on. He pulls it up and he like waves it at the boy and tells him to shut up and go away. An arm, like an actual arm. Yeah. John pops up a couple of times in the story. So like keep this shithead in mind. Okay. What's even more fucked up is that he knew that one of the kids' mom had just recently died and basically said to the kids like, hey kid, this is your mom's arm, like waving it at him. So obviously this kid is freaked out, right? So he runs home crying to his dad who was like nearby working. I mean, I say the kid was freaked out, but I'm sure the dad was pretty freaked out by this too. It's pretty damn gruesome. So they decide to like go to the grave site to make sure that their mom and wife's body are still there in her grave. And guess what? Guess what? They looked at her grave site and they realized that her body was indeed missing. Yikes. So now this dude is pissed off and honestly, same, same. He goes and gets his buddy and he's like, hey guys, like this is getting out of control. These doctors are super fucked up and they're just stealing bodies left and right. Like they, whatever. So they all head over to the hospital to confront the doctors. They storm the operating rooms, but to their surprise, 
they don't find any doctors, okay? They had all left for the day or they ran away, I don't know. But what they did find were partially dissected bodies, which made them even more upset. So the group collected all of the bodies they could in hopes to finally put them to rest by reburying them. I know, they're just carrying, everyone's just carrying bodies around. Like it's very wild, wild times. 1788, wow, wild. So if you're wondering what the doctors were up to at this time, well, let me tell you. The crowd was thinking the same thing. So a smaller group of people go out to some of the doctor's houses, you know, and they're like knocking on the doors. They want some answers. So they end up capturing four of the doctors. But before anything could happen, magically, the mayor shows up with a sheriff to rescue these poor doctors from this angry mob. Now, by this time, there was a mob of angry civilians that was growing and the doctors were fearing for their lives. I mean, it's kind of weird though, because if you're not doing anything, why should you be fearing for your lives? Huh? You know, if you're innocent. Anyways, so the sheriff ends up putting the doctors in the local jail for the night to protect them from any harm, thinking like, oh, this, don't worry, this is all going to blow over by the morning. So then the crowd dispersed sometime after they met the sheriff. The end. Just kidding. Just kidding. Of course not. We're only like halfway through. Buckle in. Okay, so overnight, those medical students broke into the graveyard of one of the biggest churches in town. And someone stole the body of a white woman. <gasps> Gasp. Gasp. I mean, the mob just dispersed. Like, come on, give it a few nights. Jeez. He must have had a paper due on the human skin the next day or something. Like, you know, he's got to get good grades. In my personal opinion, I think they didn't want to hit Scipio's gravesite because there was like a lot of heat going on. It was on high alert, you know? So they're like, hey, let's hit the other side of town. No one's looking at the white graves. Let's go over there. So obviously this made people mad all over again, okay? I mean, the issue had been festering for a while. And remember up until this point, it was mainly black bodies and non-religious grave sites that were being affected. And people were able to turn a blind eye to that, you know, but now there's arms hanging out of windows and a white woman's body was being stolen from a church. And we know from experience that nothing gets people more fired up than a white woman being fucked with, even a dead one. And at a church, that's like the three sins of 1788. If you'd like to know how mobs become riots, get a white woman involved, okay? Instant riot. Well, now everyone is pissed. Better late than never, I guess, you know? So early the next morning, a big crowd started to gather because they wanted to take this woman's body back to her grave. So they decided to go back to the doctor's houses and search for any other missing bodies they might have. Well, they had their sights set on John Hicks. Remember the doctor who was waving the, the arm out the window? He's like, mm, that guy? Well, they went looking for him, but he was already hiding somewhere and they like could not locate this man. Some historians say, and I think this is honestly like one of the funniest parts, but they thought that John Hicks was in one of the houses the mob checked, but he was hiding in someone's chimney. Yeah, like some kind of deranged Santa Claus. His bag of toys is just a bag of human arms. I don't, I don't know. But they never found him, the mob. So they needed someone else to like hold accountable for all this grave robbing. But before we get into that, we should definitely pause for an ad break. I think now is the perfect time. Today's episode is brought to you by Embark. Oh yes. Did you know that 72% of people don't know what kind of dog they have? Yeah. I mean, that's probably because they don't even have a dog. But I mean, there's actually a lot of people out there who have no idea what kind of breed their dog is. And like, that's okay because Embark is here to help. Embark is the only dog DNA test provider that gives dog owners the knowledge to understand their adorable little friends. It provides you the information needed to create personalized care plans based on your pet's DNA profile so they can live happier, healthier, and most of all, longer lives because we need them too. 
So it was developed by PhDs and veterinarians, meaning that Embark's Breed and Health Kit provides the most accurate breed identification and any genetic health results. The kit comes to your door and all you have to do is swab your dog's mouth with like a large Q-tip looking thing. And honestly, I thought Saint, my dog, my dog Saint, hey Saint, wherever you are, he's sleeping. Uh, I thought he was gonna fight me the whole time cause he, you know, but it was, so he was such a good boy. He just sat there and like, let me get some of that saliva. It was so easy. So once you get the saliva, you put the Q-tip looking thing in the prepaid envelope and then there's shipping labels provided and you send it back to Embark. I got Saint's results back pretty fast and surprise, surprise, he is 100% American bully. Which sounds so mean because he isn't a bully. He's the sweetest dog I ever did see. Oh. How dare they? <laughs> With Embark's results, they break down their health, breed, traits like body size, performance, coat traits, the list goes on. They give you lots of information. Plus they provide any relatives that they may have in their system. We learned that poor little Sainty, he's a little overweight. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a little overweight. I don't like to call him overweight. I like to call him big boned. That's why I like to call him. But we also saw that Saint's ALT level is low to normal, which is good because the ALT tool helps monitor our little friend's liver health. Something to keep an eye on, but Saint his is like good, normal, low. He's just a little overweight. <laughs> big boned, I mean, big boned. Learn your dog's inner secrets with Embark, the highest rated dog DNA test. Yeah, right now Embark has an offer on their breed and health kit for my friends listening. You can go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $50 off your Embark breed and health kit with the promo code DARKHISTORY. So again, visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code DARKHISTORY to save $50 today. A big thank you to Embark for partnering with me on today's episode. And now let's get back to the story. Shall we? Let's. Mm. So the mob, they weren't sure who to go after. So they broke into every doctor's house in town. They're busting down doors, flipping couches, ripping heaters, just destroying furniture and just doing general angry mob shit, right? And the mob just kept growing. And by the afternoon, it had grown to over 400 people. They even got both the mayor and the governor of New York out there in the streets, begging people to go home. Now remember, the sheriff had created like a little safe haven for these doctors over at the jail. So once the mob got wind of this, they're like, hey, let's go over to the jail. You know, let's go over there and demand that they be let out. Come talk to us, bro, you know? I guess so they could like beat them up or something. We don't really know what they would have done with them, but I'm sure it couldn't have been good. They kind of deserved it though. Maybe hack them up and use their bodies. Just saying a suggestion. It's like when someone says, hey, just come outside. Like, I just want to talk. I just want to talk. Like, it's a trick. They don't just want to talk. Nobody just wants to talk, okay? There's no talking involved. Well, anyways, the mayor convinced a small militia to go up against the mob and try to break things up. They're like, calm down, everyone, calm your tits. Like, mm. And I've talked about militias before, but basically all it is is before large police forces were a thing, smaller groups of men would get together and act like an amateur army. So this mini militia shows up and it's literally like 18 people up against this big ass mob. So the mob basically ignores them right? Because it's only 18 people at first. But the mob was getting restless and they see these dudes with their guns. So they swarm them. They take their weapons and they just start breaking them over their knees, telling them to F off, you know, get the fuck out of here. And that must have honestly been pretty humbling for those guys. They had to go home empty handed with like their tails between their legs. Well, now the mob is super charged up and they keep getting bigger and bigger and it ends up being like 5,000 people outside of the jailhouse and they start trying to actually break in. Keep in mind, remember earlier I said um, there was 30,000 people living in New York at the time? Yeah, so that's like almost 20% of the whole population was at this, this riot. I mean, that's insane. 
So they picked up bricks, they're throwing them, okay? They're, they're throwing stones and they're just fucking shit up left and right. But the people in the jail, they actually managed to like hold them off and hold them back. So the mob starts breaking the picket fences around the jail and they're using these sticks as weapons. It's like, girl, girl, it was a scene, okay? It's just wild, okay? So the governor is in a panic. He puts out the word that they need all available militiamen to come down and help break up this huge ass crowd. But the others in the militia tell them like, sir, we can't really do that. And he's like, well, why not? You know, we need them here. And they're like, well, that's because the rest of the militia is actually the ones in the riot. Plot fucking twist, good for them. So the governor kind of made do with what he had and managed to get about 50 men together. Most of them were just a bunch of rich dudes or men of higher stature, as they called them back then. But, oh, by the way, fun fact, one of them was actually Alexander Hamilton. His name is Alexander Hamilton. You know, he was there. Wow. But Hamilton didn't really fight or, like, get his hands dirty in any way, but... He like stood in the front of the crowd and like begged them, please stop rioting. Like you're all better than this, you guys. You're all better than this. And the crowd was like, beat it, nerd. And like pushed him, pushed past him pretty much. It's not an important part to the story, but it's just a little fun celebrity name drop. The mob is at full capacity and it's nighttime now. The militia is trying to get to the jail, but every time they get close to it, the mob starts throwing bricks, stones, and sticks at them. The governor had told the militia not to shoot at them because he just didn't want to, you know, escalate the whole situation that was going on. One militia guy got hit in the head and this started a very violent chain reaction. Oh yes, it did. So this guy gets hit in the head and then he's like screaming for the militia to fire their guns. So bang, bang, right? Bang, bang. Off they go firing at the mob. But remember, back then, guns, they, they're they nothing like they are today. It takes like a full three minutes to reload after one shot. So they're reloading and it's just, it's a little slower version, you know? The militia ended up killing eight mob members on their first shot and started to reload. It was so loud there that most of the people involved in the mob didn't even realize that they were being shot at. Once the militia fired again, the mob figured out like what was actually happening and started to charge at them. And then shit just got like real crazy, real fast, right? They kept throwing stuff at the jail while also fighting the militia and everyone's just like losing their shit. It was a full blown riot with chaos everywhere with like almost, again, 20% of New York's population. That's a party, you know? The fighting lasted until afternoon the next day. But what was most important was that the mob never got inside the jail. They tried, we'll give you an A for effort, they really tried. And besides the people who got shot right at the start, there weren't any other deaths reported. So in a weird way, the that rinky dinky army did their job. Or maybe that this riot just wasn't trying to be um violent and they were just trying to, uh, bring some acknowledgement to the situation. But this is not to say that all the doctors got off easy, okay? There were other mini mobs that formed around the city, hunting down stray doctors and medical students who were trying to escape the chaos. They were basically just beating them up. There was one doctor, Samuel Bard, who refused to leave the city. So when the mob found him at his house, he, Samuel, he threw open like his doors and windows and prepare to fight them himself. He's like, he opened up all his stuff. He's like, yeah, if you want me, like come and get me. But the mob was honestly impressed with his bravery. So they just like decided to leave him alone. That's kind of cool, you know? I don't know. It makes you wonder how far this whole thing would have gone if the doctors had just faced the music and dealt with the reality of this fucked up situation. Surely they had some morals at some point. They just wanted to study the human body. It's almost like if you see a bear in the wild, you're supposed to play dead. We should pause for an ad break, Mr. Crow. Do you agree? Do you have to go potty? Do you want me to take you outside to go potty? Sure. Okay. Shopping is a pain in the butt. I know, there's a, there's, look, there's a handful of us out there in the world who do not like shopping. For clothes? 
for clothes. I don't. I hate shopping. I, I hate it. It's not a great time. I despise shopping for clothes. It's stressful. It's uncomfortable. I get sweaty. Nothing fits right. And it's just not a good time, you know? But that's when Stitch Fix comes in, okay? Because they make it easy by doing all the work for you. So you can spend more time doing anything else other than shopping for clothes. Oh yes. Stitch Fix offers clothing that is hand selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and most importantly, your budget. Yes. They're not gonna waste your time with stuff that you can't even afford. One time I, I tried this other company and they sent like this really cute shirt, this really cute top. It was like 150 bucks. And I was like, that's cool. For who? I'm not, no, you know, like, no. Why waste my time? I was very upset. But now I have a Stitch Fix because Stitch Fix stays within your freaking budget. Thank you so much. So they send you a, a box in the mail and you get to try on the pieces at home before you even buy them. And then you can keep your favorites, right? You're like, oh my God, I love this, cute. And then you could send back the rest if you didn't like it, didn't care for it, whatever. Stitch Fix also gives you free shipping, which just makes the whole return and exchanges part super easy. And also there's no subscription required. Great. Try Stitch Fix once or set up automatic deliveries and you'll pay just a $20 styling fee for each box, which gets credited towards pieces that you end up keeping. Nice. So get started today at stitchfix.com slash dark history and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash dark history for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash dark history. Thank you Stitch Fix for partnering with me on today's episode. Now let's get back to the story. Anyway, by the next day, the militia got the mob to split up and everything kind of died down. There were more militia that came in from out of town to keep things calm. And the governor even ordered a military parade to be held just to show the mob that, you know, order would be maintained. And now the doctors started to change their tune a bit. They had to take this whole grave robbing thing seriously now. I mean, they saw how fast this whole thing escalated, like, damn it. We gotta deal with this shit, damn it. What's actually a little funny is that the city of New York, they blamed the doctors for this mess and fully sent them a bill for the damages from the mob. Oh, how the tables have turned. Hope their insurance will cover it. Was there insurance back then? I don't know. In case you forgot, the thing people were most mad about was the body of a white woman being stolen from the cemetery. And a few medical students were arrested for this crime and would go on trial like a month later. And I freaking roll, the trial was thrown out. Jeez. And none of the students faced any consequences. How are people gonna learn from their mistakes when their mistakes are never like, you know, mistakes? So I guess that hasn't changed much either. Now, there was this big anti-doctor culture happening. Even newspapers wouldn't post medical advertisements for a few days. Well, guess who pops up in this one again? Oh, it's Mr. John Hicks, the doctor who played with the severed arm. Creepy Santa? Him, yeah. He decides he needs to clear his name, okay, and he publishes a letter. The thing about John is John gets real brave when he's writing letters, but as soon as the mob shows up, he gets real hard to find. So in other words, John Hicks was a little bitch. This letter he writes says basically, quote, none of these accusations are true. I'm a great guy. You need to either stop talking about me or I'm gonna sue you, end quote. And then he just went ahead and like left town. I'm telling you, he was a little bitch because he just left. He avoided all real consequences. The town was pretty torn up and the doctors probably didn't pay that bill. So the city wanted to blame somebody for all of this. I mean, this needed to be put to rest and everyone needs to just move on, right? They need closure. And after everything, a grand jury said that the people who died in the riots should be honored. But the real crime here was not the body snatchers. It was the mob itself. In other words, the doctors were bad, but the people involved with the mob, they were worse. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe they just wanted a change to happen. Lord forbid. So New York City recognized this as an opportunity to pass some big fat penal laws. 
penal. Uh. So they created one that made grave robbing even more illegal than it already was. But this time it was very specifically targeted towards doctors saying they couldn't dig up bodies and use them for dissection. But they recognized it was important for science to have bodies to experiment on, so they allowed people who received the death penalty to have their bodies donated to medical schools. Yay? Yay? Penal. I just wanted to say it again. I just like penal. It's just such a word, isn't it? Penal. Penal. But the biggest outcome from this is that the doctors in New York, honestly, just had a really bad reputation for a long time. As they should. I mean, they were freaking stealing bodies. They want to be praised for that? Jeez. The public felt betrayed by what the doctors had done. And now whenever they thought about doctors, they thought of their friends' and family's bodies being stolen just to be cut up in some medical school. I mean, how disrespectful. So the doctors did their best to improve their reputations by saying that the people they were working on actually just didn't matter. They were like, this ain't your grandma, kid. Okay, they're just like prisoners, unknown randos, and some minorities. As usual, white people try to minimize their crimes by saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. This doesn't really hurt anybody that I know, so how could it be wrong? Well, I'm sure we all can agree here that it was wrong, okay? It's not enough to persecute and terrorize Black Americans during their life. You gotta do it in death too. One problem I have with the mob is that they had nothing to say when Scipio was trying to play by the rules and write letters because God forbid a black man exercise his right to assemble and protect his property. You know, how do you think this would have played out if he had attacked the students who were robbing him? Question mark? I mean, hello? I'm sure that wouldn't have ended well. The white doctors and medical students did all these bad things, but history has blamed the mob for the violence and not the doctors. Once again, a story of people of privilege escaping any of the justice they deserve. Outside of these events and people within this story, the idea behind what motivated both sides is sort of at that crossroads of science and humanity. They just wanted to learn about the human body, you know? And studying dead bodies was super important to advancing medical science at the time, but it was also super frowned upon and illegal. I mean, I guess like they did what they had to do, but on the other hand, like, you know, I wouldn't want, I'm sure you wouldn't want, nobody would want their mom's body being taken from the ground to some like hungover 22 year old who could like look at their kidneys. So doctors are now supposed to act by a code of ethics. Basically do no harm, I'm pretty sure. Don't wave a dismembered arm at the kids is like also on there if you read between the lines somewhere. Nowadays, we are more prepared to have that hard conversation of some stuff we can't learn because it would be kind of fucked up to test, you know, so we just like have to accept it and can't know about it. Like what happens to people who are forced to stay awake for a month straight? I don't know. It's probably horrible. And maybe there's like some science in there, but there's no way you can actually go about testing that on someone without literally torturing them. That's like some science that, you know, as of right now, we're just going to probably have to let go of it. Yeah. But the problem with ethics is that they're kind of like strongly worded suggestions. So that's why we, ha we have laws. And even people who are super smart and in positions of power should honestly be checked because, you know, just because they're in power and super smart doesn't mean that they're not abusing their positions. Uh-huh because they seem to be the ones always sliding down the slippery slope claiming it's for the greater God. If people keep dying from a ruptured appendix, but nobody knows how to find the appendix, then you need to get like some dead bodies to find that thing so you can start saving some live bodies. You see, it's a tricky but important balance and this is why I didn't become a doctor. Hmm, wasn't that fun? Wasn't the fun little story we learned today? So next time you're at the DMV, which I hope is a long time from now, because it's like literally Satan's butthole, take a second and think about that organ donation box. Because some years ago, people didn't even have a choice. And then check it. Don't be selfish. After you're long gone, you don't need that shit anyways. You're not using it anymore. 
Well, I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you know more about this? Let's continue the conversation over on social media using the hashtag dark history. I would love to hear what kind of bodies you've been snatching. Join me over on my YouTube where you can watch these episodes on Thursday after the podcast airs, except for next week, okay? Next week, we're going to take a little vacay and then we'll be back the following week on September 15th and I am looking forward to see you there. Also, you can catch my murder mystery and makeup, which drops every Monday over on my YouTube. If you miss me, you know, come over there. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You make good choices and I'll be talking to you later, September 15th. Bye. Dark History is an audio boom original. This podcast is executive produced by Bailey Sarian, Chelsea Durgan from Slash Management, and Ed Simpson from Wheelhouse DNA. Produced by Lexi Kiven, Daryl Christon, and Spencer Strassmore. Research provided by Lauren Burroughs. Writers, Jed Bookout, Michael Oberst, Joey Scavuzzo, and me, Bailey Sarian. Historical consultant for today's episode, Sam Keen, author of The Ice Pick Surgeon. And of course, me again. <laughs> Hi, I'm your host, Princess, Princess Bailey Sarian. I just want to be princess. How about that?